So we're really glad to be able to have this second event and, and kind of follow up on our event in January, which was a, a major hit. But um, today we're going to be specifically talking about the economic stimulus package. Of course, that's why you're all here. And, uh, and I know there's tons of questions out there, so we are going to get questions from the audience and, and let you guys have some dialogue. Uh, but before I do that, I want to introduce our panel, which we have an outstanding panel. We're really excited about, again, to um, follow up on the January panel. So um, what I thought I would do, though, uh, is, is uh, just dive right in. And what I'm going to do is I want to give the panelists a chance to introduce themselves, kind of where they're coming from, and a brief, very brief three-minute analysis of, of their view on the current climate, the situation, not only the stimulus, but uh, I guess health care, IT, health care reform in general, and, and then relate that to the discussion today. So um, I'll just go ahead and start right here with Sean, and uh, we'll just go right down the line. Hi, I'm, I'm Sean Hogan, and, I, and in terms of where I'm from, I guess as soon as I open my mouth, it's clear I'm not a Georgia person. I'm from the Northeast. I'm not a Yankee fan, though. I, I'm from Boston. I live in New York City area. I'm working for IBM. Oh, <laughs> I'm always happy to come down here, though. I love coming to Georgia. It's always been uh, – we have some great clients here. Um, people are always super friendly, so you'll all be nice to us today, this morning. Um, so IBM's interest in, in what are we up to in, in healthcare and why are we interested in a topic like this? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm from our healthcare and life sciences group, um, responsible for the healthcare delivery system side of things. Healthcare and life sciences is about a $5 billion business for IBM globally. It's an area where we see a lot of growth potential and a lot of opportunity. Seventy percent of our business is in North America, so that's five billion plus, about uh, over two-thirds of it here is in North America. Um, when we serve our industry, so we're not, not a, a provider of healthcare services, we enable the healthcare industry and our clients with the use of our technology. So you can kind of think of that in three general areas. There's the infrastructure services, the data centers, the um, virtualization, the work that we do kind of underneath the processing to help enable healthcare transactions. We do a lot of work in enabling information integration and solutions. So that's um, aggregating information, providing analytic capabilities to improve business processes. We also see ourselves as a thought leader and change agent. And you know, from IBM's perspective, of a large employer, we care deeply about the quality of health care that we have uh, for our employees. Um, we have about 500,000 covered lives in North America, so those are our employees, their dependents, retirees, and the cost effectiveness of the health care that we provide to them is a, a very significant concern. And when you look at what's happened in uh, the manufacturing sector of our economy, what's happened to the auto industries, the burden of the cost of our health care system is significantly consequential to our ability to compete. So IBM, as, an, as a, progressor, a progressive employer, has looked at what is the, the, the cost in the, of our health care and what's the effectiveness. And we, we've seen an inverse correlation between how much we spend on health care, and this is when we look globally, you know, when we compare the health care that we get within different countries or within this country, um, we see a, a discrepancies. And it's not a pay more, get more. It, it's, it's in the areas where we're paying more, we're not necessarily getting the best of quality. So we put a lot of energy into understanding what are the attributes of the system that provide uh, more effective care, enabling a quality of, of care to the patient surrounded by the care system, especially the physician, is something that's very important to us. And we think there's a very important role for information technology in, in helping enable all of that. So, of course, the stimulus, and we'll talk about these things more, but we're interested in what the stimulus has to offer. We're optimistic about it. And we see, um, and I think you maybe have seen some of our Smart Planet uh, messaging that talks about how we're thinking about the role that information technology, how we're more interconnected, we can be more intelligent. We're looking forward to applying those capabilities in the healthcare industry. So thanks. Welcome, by the way, okay, to the great, South. Great to be here. <laughs> uh, I'm Wayne Oliver. Um, 
and I'm a recovering lobbyist. Um, uh, Every th th thanks, ladies. Every panel's got to have one. I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm with the Center for Health Transformation, a, um, a large collaboration of, um, of leaders from around the country uh, focusing on changing the dynamic of health and health care. Uh, and as uh, Sean indicated, um, HIT really is at the very center of improving uh, health. W what we've been able to determine uh, relatively shortly uh, is um, uh, when we do have data, we can begin to measure uh, outcomes, something that, you know, we have, we have no clue about. When, when we first started getting into this, you ask physicians, um, are, you know, are you providing good care for your patients with diabetes? And they all go, sure, man, we, we, we're the best at taking care of our patients with diabetes. And then you start doing a manual review of that delightful paper chart that they have and determined that the last time that patient with diabetes um, received an eye exam was in 1986, and that the last time their feet were examined were two years ago. And uh, the, the clinical measures that determine whether or not quality care is being provided um, uh, simply weren't being provided. However, um, everything from best practices to e-prescribing, um, the, the center was founded by Newt Gingrich, and, and he often says that, that physicians who do not use e-prescribing are reserving the right to kill their patients, which is true. It sounds rather dramatic, but over 7,000 people die annually just because of preventable medication misadventures. Wrong drug, wrong patient, wrong strength, wrong time. Um, electronic systems won't necessarily eliminate all of those deaths or the 100,000 injuries that occur from that, but they certainly will help. Um, and all that leads to the bottom line, which is, which is what you were talking about, Sean, delivering better care, higher quality at a lower cost, all of which um, electronic platforms can help do. So I'm delighted to be here. Hi, I'm Maria Rudolph. I'm the VP of Business Development at EMDs, which is an ambulatory EHR vendor based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, my connection to this group is primarily through um, Coker and, and Jeffrey down there <laughs> at the end of the, uh, of the line. Uh, I, I, I primarily follow government relations and government initiatives for my company, um, but I have a very varied background. It just attests to that if you want to get into this realm, you can do it pretty easily if you just kind of get out there and get on the websites and read and learn. Um, I came from the acute care vendor world, acute care hospital setting, um, was very involved in sort of the standards that are going to become very important with this stimulus bill. Um, EMDs is a solutions provider that's targeted primarily for the uh, solo and small practices, and um, that's the group that needs to purchase still. If you look at any of the um, adoption lines, you'll see that they're in the 5% range, whereas larger groups are in the 30% range. And largely what we see from that is because of the upfront costs of it. So there are going to be new models for trying to um, finance this, to bridge people to the point where the incentives kick in. And I think Jeff will probably talk on that as well. I think that the stimulus package, um, you know, when it first came out, I remember being surprised just because it was so tied to jobs. And then, you know, I'd sit back and think, what is it about jobs? And, and it dawned on me the fact that they want to have everyone with a health record in half the amount of time that um, President Bush said led me to believe what numbers are they looking at getting installed in the base. So our estimates are now at 50,000 docks within this time period. Our industry as it is cannot handle that. Um, I sit on the EHRA Association, on their executive committee, and we deal with this daily. Like, what can we do to make sure we message this correctly, to make folks understand that um, to get these incentive payments, you really have to um, start now. Of those of you, I don't know how many of you are in business process reengineering or QI, but those of you who've done it, and I've done it in the hospital space for a long time, that it, change is not easy and that um, buying a software system is not like going to Best Buy, picking it off the shelf and plugging it into your computer, which having worked for ACC and ACP, two large medical associations, is a message that people sometimes could not understand because why, just go and get my software, this is all I need to do, it's plug and play, isn't it? 
and it isn't. So um, those are some of the things that I'd probably like to touch on as um, we go through this session today. Uh, okay, uh, Glenn Pearson, Executive VP at Georgia Hospital Association, and I've had the privilege of uh, speaking to this group before. I appreciate your uh, inviting me back. Um, Wayne had a confession that he was a recovering lobbyist, and I have a confession that I'm extremely conflicted over the situation we're in right now. I'm very excited about the HIT component. Uh, you know, the $19 billion is spectacular. The emphasis on electronic health records for all the reasons that have been stated are terrific. And uh, some of you know that we have an initiative here in Georgia, the Georgia Health Information Exchange. Tracy's on the board with me, and Jim Bracewell's in the back, and some other folks in the room maybe too. So we're very committed, very excited about the potential of this. So that's the good side. The bad side is that um, right now we are facing a very severe funding situation here in Georgia around the Medicaid program, which I think is going to suck a lot of the air out of the issue of IT. And I'll probably say more about this later, but just in a nutshell, uh, we have under the um, stimulus program, Georgia it will be getting about $700 million for fiscal 2010 for Medicaid, which is great. That money is all going to Medicaid. However, what's happening is right now, today and tomorrow and over the weekend, the, the legislature is deliberating over the budget. Only a, a very small portion of that is actually going to Medicaid because essentially what's happening is they're supplanting the existing funding for Medicaid uh, and sending it other places. And there's about $500 million essentially net out of the $700 million that's not going into health care. And on top of that, providers are facing a cut of about $450 million. So we're, we're getting $700 million and we're getting a cut of about 400, over $400 million. So if you do the math, there's a swing of nearly a billion dollars from the 2010 budget as now proposed that could be coming into health care, could be coming into Medicaid, that's not. And I'm extremely concerned because we have hospitals that are teetering, hospitals and physicians both, are teetering on the edge of not being here. And I can tell you that IT is not on the top of their mind right now. They're worrying about making payroll tomorrow. I don't think they're going to be spending a lot of time on IT. So somebody has to be the cloud of doom, and they asked me to play that role today, so I'm happy to do that. <laughs> you forget you're sitting next to a lawyer. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tracy Field. I'm a partner at Arnold Golden um, Gregory here in town. And I used to work in healthcare before I went to law school. And um, I, I, they sat us together for a reason because I think uh, the real employment act associated with the stimulus bill is probably for lawyers trying to figure out what exactly this bill is about. Um, imagine that it's not particularly well drafted and that there's some questions pretty serious about, <laughs> I find that hard to believe, I know. Um, uh, and, in fact, I, uh, as part of my career, I worked in D.C. for a while, and a friend of mine is at HRSA, and is, I spoke to you yesterday about um, some of the new little gems that are in the stimulus package associated not only with the IT, what, what is the certification? She was saying, you know, I wish they'd have said in the statute, what is the certification body? Um, what are the uh, physicians, if you, bought a, if you bought a piece of software, this is the fear. I bought something that was certified in 06. It's not on the list now. Uh, does that count? A um, lot of unanswered questions. And she told me, you know, we have $2 billion as it's just at HRSA to spend. We don't have the people. I don't know who to get to figure out how to do this. And the other thing I was saying to her, well, you know, all these new privacy issues, the mandatory reporting, the penalties, et cetera, you know, and um, we have these red flag rules that are coming into effect on May 1. So, I mean, I'm struggling with how to help clients figure out what are you doing with all of this. And um, her answer was, oh, you know what, we're really not, you're thinking of it from the provider's point of view. We haven't really, you know, we're just thinking IT and they get in the tunnel. So, um, anyway, so that's why they sat us beside each other. I certainly have some concerns. What's meaningful adoption? There's a lot of ambiguity in the statute that I think is not, um, it, it is a full employment act for a lawyer who wants to slog through it, I suspect. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Jeffrey Daggerpont with the, uh, I'm a senior vice president with the uh, Coker Group. 
And uh, my, my role here, quite honestly, was just uh, to, to try to uh, provide some information at a high level. We um, see ourselves as, the, as being the advocate for physicians and, and hospitals. We do a lot of uh, publishing and writing and speaking on this topic. And uh, certainly to come here as, as the, you know, I guess a, a knowledgeable person on this subject is, would be, would be un, untrue because it's, it's a lot like drinking from the fire hose right now. A lot of this stuff is, is, is still coming out. What I can say is that um, within Coker, we, we are a national consulting firm, so we, and, and we have a, a division that's specifically focused on IT. We automate about 3,000 physicians a year, and that equates to about 90 million in, HI, in procurement of HIT services. About 30% of our projects are removing failed systems or having to go back in and reinvigorate systems that are backsliding. And while this incentive and, and the stimulus is intriguing, uh, I really don't think it's about the money. There's been free EMR systems around for years that haven't been adopted. The hospitals, for the last two years, have been able to subsidize up to 85 percent of, um, you know, of the cost of an EHR, and that hasn't really uh, gotten much adoption traction uh, either. So um, what I was hoping to do is maybe just um, provide some third-party, uh, non-biased perspective, um, and I think Mark wanted me to kind of kick off um, yeah. that sort of high level, so I'll kind of just go right into, and then we'll, we'll pass it back and forth. But uh, what I thought, since this audience is mostly industry, uh, folks, um, I would break this down into three segments. Uh, those that are really excited about it, those that don't want to see it, and then what are the physicians, how are the physicians reacting to it? So I think the, the, the first immediate reaction that we saw within our organization was that there were all kinds of folks quickly coming out with the message that there's 500,000 physicians without an EMR and only $19 billion. You better buy something real quick before the money runs out. I think that's a little unfortunate because that's, that's the impulsive method. Those are, you know, you know, folks trying to make a fast buck. The, the second reaction was from those vendors who really don't have certified products, and their message was, why would you go buy a government CMR? Do you really want to share data? Uh, this is going to control your practice. It's, it's not in your best interest to do this. Uh, the, the definitions aren't defined yet. Uh, if your practice isn't heavily utilizing Medicare, then you may not get as much out of it anyways. And then, uh, then the physicians, you know, they're intrigued, but, but again, uh, there's so much uncertainty that, that it's hard for them to, to, to make the decision and, and, and ex know exactly how to react to it. The best way that I could probably put this, that everybody in this room can relate to it, if you think of your BlackBerry, and most of us have one, um, it, it, it is something, in, in a lot of ways, a physician today who has a paper chart sees that paper chart much like we see our, our BlackBerry, something we couldn't live without. It's what they use, it's their tool, it's what they know, it's what they're, what they're comfortable with. If the government walked in this room today and said, hey, folks, I have an incentive for you of about $40,000 if you will adopt new software for your BlackBerry, but there's going to be a catch. Here's the catch. You have to put up front about $30,000 personal investment for that software. And oh, by the way, you're not going to get it all at once. You're going to get it over a period of time. And oh, by the way, instead of the way you used to use your BlackBerry, you're now going to have to do full, complete registration of, of your contacts. I need to know a lot. You know, Just entering a name and a phone number and an email address is no longer going to cut it. You're going to have to give, I need to know why you're putting the contact in there, what you're going to do with the contact. And, and also, by the way, when you send an email, you need to send an email in a structured format and interoperate with all your business colleagues because we feel that's the way it's going to save us money. At the end of the day, the doctor price sits back and says, wow, is this even worth it? Uh, and, and that's some of the reaction we're getting from, from our physicians uh, as, as it relates. They're intrigued by it, but, but you know, it's, it's one of those things. Now, the other side of the coin is I do think the, the, the big kicker is that it will result into a deduction at a certain point, at least that's what's proposed. Uh, I have a, a, you know, this is just my opinion, but I think that will probably be extended out as, as the realization uh, comes to play that, that we cannot uh, do this. We were just talking a second ago. Maybe some of you have seen this. This is actually kind of funny. Walmart, through Sam's Club, is now going to bundle uh, and give ECW credit. They, they got the contract, and it's all based on volume sales. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen in this industry a vendor who's been successful with the volume sales model. 
uh, it, it just has never never worked. In fact, it's counterproductive to, to adoption in, in most cases. So that's kind of high level. Uh, there's a lot of detail. I know you folks probably read um, all the information coming out. Uh, I, I certainly uh, didn't want to come here and read to you. But, I, but, I, but the reaction, quite honestly, is all over the map. And I think for the most part right now, physicians are certainly intrigued by it, but they're in a little bit of a wait-and-see mode. And most everybody, even hospitals and no matter what sector you're in, you are really um, being very cautious about what you spend money on and, and not wanting to jump into it too soon. Okay, and I'm <clears throat> going to jump in here. You knew I would. But um, w one other thing that hospitals and providers across the country, I think, are also much more focused on right now is there's a new – a lot of new audit programs from the government to come out, um, the bounty hunters, the, um, the RACs, the, who are incentivized to go out and find and identify overpayments, which has terrorized a lot of hospitals in particular. Um, and so, and I do a lot of Medicare reimbursement appeals. And I can tell you, reading hard, you know, I would love to have electronic medical records, but that's just not the case. And if, so when you're thinking about spending resources, people are thinking, I need to worry about making sure there are specific timelines. I've got to get these records out in 30 days. If I don't, et cetera. I mean, it is a whole new regime. It's brought in compliance. It's a whole new cost to people to prepare. And that's just one of all. There are several new programs I won't bore you with, but that's one thing. The other point is that there is some sentiment within in the provider community as well a concern with electronic medical records and billing issues, and particularly the physician issues with E&M coding, uh, evaluation management. Part of how a physician gets paid is how much time they spend talking to you to say, you know, what, what has happened since your last visit, et cetera. And there's some, and I'd be curious to hear your comments on this, but there's some suggestion from the government, if you cut and paste and you submit that claim, it's fraud because you haven't really spent the time with the patient, and therefore you're overbilling. And if we see too much cut and paste, we're going to be worried about stuff. Well, to me, that's ridiculous from the government. I hope there's no government people in the room. Um, or no IRS, at least. Um, um, you know, we want electronic medical records. You want the efficiencies, legibility. You want those mistakes not to be made. And at the same time, now you're going to suggest, if I used a template and I checked it off and dictated it, I could get away, I could do the same thing. But now it's fraud.